said, well, here's an axe. I want to see how quickly you can fell this tree down. So he was young, strong, athletic. Man, he cut that tree down in record time. The, the, the foreman said, okay, you start on Monday, you got the job. The young man worked Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, towards the end of his shift on Thursday, the foreman come up to him and said, uh, by the way, on your way out, I need you to stop by the office. I need you to pick up your check. Today's the last day you're working with us. And the young guy said, boss, what, what happened? Why am I getting fired? Why am I getting let go? He said, well, you know what? We keep uh, charts of, of all, all the production. And, and you have dropped dramatically since Monday. On Monday, you were our top producer. Uh, on, on Tuesday, you were in the middle of the pack. By Wednesday, you were our worst producer by far. We just can't do it. We're going to have to let you go. And he was like, boss, I, I'm working through my, my breaks and my lunches. I don't know what happened. And the foreman, he could sense that this guy he had, it was, a, was a man of integrity and just had passion and something must have gone wrong. And he thought, and he said, you know what? Let me ask you a question. Throughout the day, have you been taking time to sharpen your axe? And the young man said, I've been far too busy to do that, boss. Such an innocent but fatal mistake that cost this man his job. You know what? Likewise, there are many believers, many followers of Christ that make almost the same identical mistake when we fail to sharpen our lives in and through prayer. I've been praying, uh, thinking a lot and praying a lot these last, uh, this last month, trying to decide what's the first thing I should say to you as, as your pastor? What's the first series we should cover together? And, and, and the more I thought about it, the more I prayed about it, God continued to impress upon me that the first thing we need to cover is what you see on the screen. What does it mean to live and to depend on God in prayer? And so for the month of June, we are going to double down on something that I think we're probably already pretty good at, but we need to get great at it. Uh, I'm going to start out by uh, showing you two passages, one from the Old Testament where God is speaking, the Father, and one from the New Testament where Jesus is speaking. We'll put them up on the screen. And here's what we read, Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7. God says, these I will bring to my holy mountain. I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer. Now, fast forward to the New Testament, the story or the verse in Mark chapter 11. This is where Jesus gets a little cray cray in the temple. He walks in, he overturns the money, the tables of the money changers. He is ticked off. He's ticked off not only because of what they've, they've done to the temple, but what they've failed to do in the temple. And Jesus, after overturning the, money the tables of the money changers, he says this. He says, the scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. So what, what I want to help you do this morning is I want to make sure that either the house that you live in, your family, or the house that you worship in, Journey, or maybe it's another church, is known as, quote, a house of prayer. The house you live in or the house that you worship in is known as a house of prayer. Now, to do that, I'm going to tell you in advance, I'm going to ask you to make one of two applications and steps this morning. I either want you to increase, everybody say increase. Okay, no, when that pastor says everyone, that means everyone. Everyone say increase. increase. Everybody say improve. improve. You're going to do one or the other. You either need to increase your prayer time. There are some of you around here that know how to pray. When you pray, you do a pretty good job. The problem is you're not doing it enough. You're not putting enough time into it. So, so for example, if you wanted to get in shape, uh, maybe let's say you want to lose a little weight or whatever, you get a gym membership, you hire a trainer. First day, you go into the gym, you sit down with the trainer, and you work out for three minutes. What would the trainer say? Not enough time. I mean, the three minutes you put in were good three minutes. It's just not long enough. And some of us as followers of Christ are doing the same thing with prayer. You know how to pray. When you pray, you're doing a good job. You're just not doing it long enough. Some of you just need to increase the amount of time that you pray. Now, there are others here that I want to encourage you to improve the content of your prayer. So, 
for, 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 for those of us that are here that, that need to improve the content of your prayer, I'm going to give you some suggestions on how to put teeth to your prayer. You're, you're praying, and maybe you're even doing it a decent amount of time, but I want to give you some new ideas in terms of what should I be praying for, for the house that I live in and the house that I worship in. You guys understand where we're going. If you want to follow along, we got the study guide in your programs that you can follow along, jot notes. I want to encourage you to to do that, but we're going to start out if you have your Bibles in First Chronicles chapter 4. First Chronicles chapter 4, I'm going to put the verses on the screen, but it's always good if you can pull it up on your phone or have a Bible with you to follow along. First Chronicles 4, 1 through 8, here's what we read. The descendants of Judah, Perez, Hezron, Kamri, Hur, Shobal. Reiah, son of Shobal, was the father of Jathath, Jathath, the father of Ahumai and Lahad. These were the clans of the Zorathites. These were the sons of Elam, Jezreel, Ishma, and Idbash. Their sister was named Hazelponi. Penuel was the father of Gedor, and Ezer the father of Heshush. These were the descendants of Hur, the firstborn of Ephrath, and the father of Bethlehem. Ashur, the father of Tekoa, had two wives, Helal and Nara. Nara bore him Azum, Hefer, Temeni, Hashtari. These were the descendants of Nara. The sons of Helal, Hereth, Zohar, Ethan, and Koz, who was the father of Anub and Hezbeba, and the clans of Harel, son of Harum. Isn't this just breathtaking scripture we just read? <laughs> okay, it's just us. Just be honest. When you're at home and you're reading your Bible on your own and you get to these verses, what do you normally do? We just skip it. Those of you who won't admit it, you're lying, right? Now, here's the thing. We get to these, we're like, what, what is going on here? Right? I don't, but theologically, when you look at our statement of faith, we believe that everything in this book is here for a reason. Everything in this book has some way to encourage you and or to help us. So just real quickly, what, what is going on here? Well, you have to remember that the book of Chronicles is written at a time when the Jewish nation is trying to conquer the promised land. And when you look at that story, they come to times where they're like, uh, we're not sure we're going to win. We think we might get wiped off the face of the earth. You know what? We should have stayed in Egypt. They're, they're having all these second thoughts. So the, the chronicler, the historian, writes these verses. He's like, oh, time out, time out. Just like some of you walked in here today with concerns and worries about your today and concerns and worries about your tomorrow. Something's going on in your life that's not clicking. It's not working. And you're concerned. And the, so were the Jewish people. And the historian goes, you want sometimes the best thing to do if you're concerned about your today and your tomorrow, you need to look into the rear view mirror of life and you need to look at your past. You need to remember all the times that God took care of you. All the times that God protected you all the times that he was faithful to you, all the times that he encouraged you, all the times that he loved you. And when you look back and you see everything he's done for you, and as the Jews did that, all he did for you, generation after generation after generation, we sang it in our songs this morning. Your faithfulness in past generations can give me confidence in the future. And that's what the historian is doing. Oh no, I get that you're nervous about your today and your tomorrow, but what can give you peace and confidence is look at your yesterday. God isn't going to drop you after everything he's invested into you. And some of you should and can be encouraged by that. Now, in the middle of all these names, the historian, it's like he clears his throat. He takes a little bit of water. He's like, you know what? There's a dude I really got to tell you about. I don't want to just give you his name. This guy, is he's only mentioned two verses in all the scripture. The two verses we're going to read right now but they are power-packed verses. The first one comes in verse 9. He's introduced to us. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. It's interesting that he's pointed out that he's more honorable than his brothers. He's more righteous. He, he, has, he has, more, has more integrity. He's more trustworthy than anyone else in his family. Because of that, what I'm going to share with you, you got what he did, you got to do. What he said, you got to say. And in a moment, what he prays, you got to pray. Why? Because he's more honorable than anyone else in his family. And then he, the, the, the writer adds one thing. His mother named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. Now, 
This is, is Hebrew Comedy Central at its best. This is funny stuff. So he's, his name, Jabez, in Hebrew literally means pain. That's what it means. And you're like, why, why would his mom name him that? It's, we're told. Basically what happens is that, you know, um, she, mom goes into labor, right? She, I, I don't know what happens. She gets to the hospital and it's too late for an epidural. So she gets no epidural. Then she has contractions for seven hours. She's pushing for 10 hours. It's a horrible experience. After Jabez is born, the, they, they wrap him up, they clean him up. The nurse comes back, puts, puts the baby in, in, in mom's hands and goes, what do you want to name him? And mom's like, you know what? I had a great cute name picked out, but after these last 10 hours, nope, I'm calling him pain. Can you imagine how much this kid got teased in junior high? He got teased like crazy. Here comes pain, right? Now, one of the things that impresses me about Jabez, though, is that he doesn't allow his past pain to influence his future blessing. He doesn't allow his past failures to influence his future blessing. You know, there's a number of us, maybe all of us walked in here with flawed pasts. Pasts filled with failure, past filled with drug addictions or other addictions, past failure dealing with the law and problems that we had, past failure dealing with divorce number one and then divorce number two, past dealing with bankruptcy, getting fired from this job and getting fired from that job, past dealing with family blow-ups and family dysfunction, past dealing with career mistakes and disappointment after disappointment, the good news is this, is that because of Jesus, he can take your past failure and he can repair it and he can restore it and he can redeem it and give you a blessed future. See, that right, right there was an amen moment and the Holy Spirit was only working like over here one person. So we're going to try this again, okay? God can take your past and he can repair it and he can redeem it and he can restore it and give you a blessed future. Okay, I'll put some time into next week's sermon as well. That was good. Okay. <laughs> now we come to the prayer. Now we come to the teeth of what we're looking at this morning. And in verse 10, here's what we read. Let's put it on the screen. Jabez, he cried out. It's interesting that that phrase is used, right? He's praying, but sense the, you can sense the passion. You can sense almost the desperation. Jabez cried out and prayed to the Lord, the God of Israel, oh, that you would bless me that you would enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me. Keep me from harm so that, you will, so that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. He answered his prayer. Now, I told you in advance that one of the things I'm trying to do is motivate some of you just to spend more time in prayer. You already know how to pray. I just want to encourage you to walk out of here and spend twice as much time this next week praying than you did this last week. So I'm just, just trying to motivate you. So in your study guide, here's what I want to start by giving you. I want to give you three reasons why you should increase your time in prayer. Three reasons. So put the first one up on the screen. Number one, because when you and I pray, power is deployed in our lives. When you and I pray, power is deployed in our lives. I watched some of you walk into church today, shuffle into church. You look exhausted. I mean, the best thing some of you could do is go home and take a nap. You are tired. Huh? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but you know who you are. You don't want to know why some of us are so tired. Some of us are so exhausted. Not everyone. Some of us simply are tired because we are not relying or accessing the power and the strength available to us through God, the Holy Spirit in prayer. You are literally trying to do life in your own strength. That's why you're so tired. That's why you're so exhausted. Praying doesn't take the problem away. Praying gives you power to deal with the problem. Does that make sense? But let me give you some visual examples of, of what I mean. First of all, let's put it up there, Ernesto. So left side of the screen, that is your life with prayer. It's like being on a racehorse. Some of us are on the right side of the screen. That is your life without prayer. Some of you still don't get it. Let's put the next one up there, okay? 
Left side of the screen, this is your life with prayer, like all those super, super trains that you get in, in Japan. Right side of the screen, some of, the, some of us are living a life like choo-choo trains, life without prayer. Let me give you another one. Let's put it up there. This is your life with prayer. You're active. You're working. Some of us are just playing foosball because we're not praying enough. Let me give you another one. This is your life with prayer. It's like driving a Formula One race car. The next uh, other, some of us are driving this one. Now, this next one, I think, will, will really resonate with some of you. Let's go ahead and put it up there. This is your... Thank you. I'm getting prayed for and booed on my first Sunday. Sit down, Ernesto. He's booing me from the back. <laughs> I'm just trying to help you and bless you in all areas of your life. So we'll, we'll talk about this. So let me tell you why, why our staff team decided to kind of pick this, the, the video bumper and the image that we did. Let's put the last one up there. Uh, years ago, I, I, had, um, I saw a poster that looked just like this. And it inspired me and it made me think. It's what, why I gave you all these other images. Now, now, joking aside, I want you to think about literally the amount of time that you're praying and ask yourself, be honest, just you and God, what side of the screen are you living on? See, we know what this book says. The problem is that we don't know it. The problem is that some of us aren't living it. And I'm just trying to motivate you to spend a little more time in prayer and see what God does. Is that fair? Let me give you the other two. The other two, let's put them up there. Uh, second of all, when we pray, relationship grows. So listen, prayer is the difference between knowing about God and having relationship with God. Let me say that again. Prayer is the difference be between knowing about God and having relationship with God. So for example, I know of a guard that plays for the, the LA Lakers called LeBron James. I know about him, but I don't have relationship with him. You want to know why? We don't text each other. We don't call each other. We don't email each other. We don't communicate. I know about him, but I don't have relationship with him. And many Christian churches are filled with Christians that know about God. They know about the Bible. They know about Jesus. They know about the cross. They know about salvation through faith alone. They know all the right things. They're going to be in heaven. High five. We love you. You know about God, but you do not have relationship with God because you're not spending time communicating with him. Well, how do I do that? Real simple. You let him talk to you. That's why I want to encourage you every day to pick this book up. And if it's just one chapter a day, do the best you can to go, God, talk to me. You let him talk to you. And then you talk to him. That's called prayer. Listen to me really carefully. If God never answered any of your requests, none, and all prayer was was you just having relationship with God, it would be worth your time. Why do you and I pray? Because power is deployed in our lives. Because relationship grows. And the last one is because coincidences happen. Now, I put them in quotation marks because that's what the world is going to say about what happens to you and I when answers come our way. They're going to call them coincidences. And, and we're going to go, yeah, but we think there's something else behind it. It's like this family who... Um, they bought a, a, a kitten for their two kids. And uh, it was the cutest little kitten. And on week number one, they took the kitten out to the front yard. And he was cute and he was fluffy. And the two kids were playing with the kitten in the front yard. The kitten decided to start to climb up the tree. And they thought that was kind of cute. And he climbed up the tree. Eventually, he got away from them just a little bit. And they couldn't reach up. And well, he's a cat. He climbed up. Then he got stuck in the branches. And there was a lot of branches. They were sharp branches. And the cat started to meow and he was in distress. And mom tried to get the cat down, couldn't get down because of all the branches. And, and, and the cat was not doing well. Right at that moment, dad walked out of the house, who happened to, happened to also be a pastor. He saw the predicament that the family was in. And uh, he said, I got a plan. I've got a solution. He says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my car and I'm going to get a rope. And I'm going to come, and I'm going to, I'm going to tie one end of the rope to the, to the tree, and I'm going to tie the other end of the rope to the car. Then I'm going to get in the car, and I'm going to start to drive. And I start to drive, the tree is going to bend. I start to drive, the tree is going to bend. This is going to go on and on until you can reach up, grab the cat, 
save it, problem solved. Everybody was like, Daddy! He's like, okay, so just everyone stay here, keep an eye on the cat. He went inside, he got his keys. He went to the garage, he got the, he got the rope. He, uh, he tied one, one end, to, one end to, the, to the tree, he tied the other end to the car. He got inside, he turned the engine on, he said, okay, guys, here I go. And he started to inch forward ever so slightly. And as he inched forward, sure enough, the tree started to bend. And he would inch forward and the tree started to bend. He was moving forward slowly, slowly. And the tree was bending, bending. The mom was reaching up and she yelled out. She said, honey, just a little bit more, just a little bit more. Get the tree to bend just a little bit more. I can grab the cat. And as this was going on, all of a sudden, bam, the rope snapped. And the rope snapped and the, the tree shot forward at lightning speed. And the cat was launched into the atmosphere in the opposite direction. And that's the end of the story. <laughs> um, dad got out of the car. Mom was yelling. The kids were crying, right? And, uh, and, and the kids went, and, take the kids inside. Dad walked around for, for an hour and a half looking for that kitten. Couldn't find it. Gone. And so, so two weeks later, the same pastor, the same pastor uh, wanted, went to go visit a family in, the, in his church, in his congregation. And he knocked on the front door, and the, the lady of the house opened him up, opened the door, and, and, oh, pastor, it is so good to see you. Why don't you come into our living room? I'm going to go make some coffee. I'll be back in a moment. And he went into the living room. Wouldn't you believe it? There was their cat. It was unmistakable. That was their kitten. And this family had this cat. Lady came back with coffee. He didn't want to accuse them, didn't want to put them on the defensive. And uh, so he said, uh, <clears throat> that's an awfully nice cat that you have there. <laughs> How long have you had the kitten? And the lady of the house said, Pastor, you're not going to believe what happened. <laughs> Two weeks ago, Johnny and I were in the backyard playing. You know Johnny, my little Johnny. He's in first grade. He goes to Sunday school class. Johnny and I were in the backyard. We were playing. Johnny came to me. He looked up at me with his big brown eyes, and he said, Mommy, I want a cat. And I said, Johnny, we've talked about this. We're not getting a cat. We're not getting a cat because all the work's going to fall on me. We're not going to do it. Pastor, Johnny kept insisting, Mommy, I really want a cat. Mommy, please, let's get a cat. Pastor, I didn't know what else to say. So I said, okay, Johnny, here's what we're going to do. Right here in our backyard, we are going to get down on our knees, and we are going to pray to our Lord Jesus and ask for a cat. And if God wants to give you a cat, he'll give you a cat. Pastor, no, we prayed, and no sooner did he say amen. You're not going to believe what dropped from the skies. Why do we pray? We pray because when we pray, power is deployed in our lives. When we pray, relationship grows. And when we pray, kittens drop from the sky. Let me see by a show of hands, by what you see on the screen, how many of you are motivated just a little bit more to spend more time in prayer? That's why we pray. Now, how do we improve the content of our prayer? How do we give our prayer teeth? Let's break down the prayer. He asks for three things. Three things. Number one, he asks for blessing. He asks for blessing. He said, straight up, God bless me. Now, when you first read this, maybe it's just me, this it feels a little selfish. Feels a little me. I'll take care of me, not everyone. I'm praying for me. I think part of the problem is that we we fail to understand how Scripture uses the word bless and what it means by blessing. We use the word, someone sneezes, and we say, God bless you, right? We spend an hour or two at someone at Starbucks, they go this way, they, I go that way, and we say, God bless you, right? And, and we, 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 after, after, after church today, we're going to get together with family, and, and someone might, might say a blessing over the food. We have taken this word and we have so watered it down to basically mean nothing more than I hope you have a good day. But it means so much more in Scripture. So much more. Did you know that there are stories in the Old Testament where family members and brothers fight over each other over blessing? It is so important. It is so significant that there is basically battles between family members for years. Did you know there's a story in the New Testament where a group of brand new Christians having experienced the resurrection, I mean, you talk about momentum. They refuse to leave an upper room until God blesses them with Holy Spirit power. 
This is a big deal in Scripture. I've given you the definition and the meaning on the screen. What does it mean? Well, blessing refers to supernatural power or favor, spiritual prosperity, unusual kingdom success, infusion of Holy Spirit power, gifting of godly wisdom. Be honest. When's the last time you prayed, God bless me? When's the last time you prayed for that? God, give me your favor. Give me your prosperity. Give me success. Give me Holy Spirit power. Give me godly wisdom. Because that's what it, what it means to say God bless me. There's a man that got to heaven, and um, the first thing you do when you get to heaven is they give you a tour. And so they were walking him around, and they said, well, here, uh, this is the most important, this is the worship center. I mean, you, you the, the best bands and choirs in it ever are there leading worship. That's where Jesus spends most of his time. It is just fabulous. 24 hours a day, you can go into the worship center. Then he took him to restaurant row. 250 restaurants with the top chefs. And the angel says to the guy, he goes, it's the best food that has ever been made. It is delicious beyond description. Uh, it, it is free and it is calorie free as well, right? And all God's people said, that's what the food is like in heaven. He walked him around, he showed him the lake. Then he took him to his castle, the mansion he gets to live in for eternity. He says, here's your castle. And we're going to change the furnishings every six months. We have someone come to clean and, and do everything you need every day. I mean, this is where you get to live. If you want something, let us know. And then as they were walking through heaven, they came to this warehouse. And in this warehouse, you know, the, the guy, I mean, it was long. It went on for miles, miles. And, 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 and it went super, super high. And the, the guy asked the angel, what, what, is, what is this? He goes, you want to see inside? They go inside, they walk. And it's a, this warehouse is jam-packed with presents and gifts. They're all wrapped. They've got bows on them. And then he notices they have name tags, different people's names. He's got what? And if they keep walking, wouldn't you know it, he finds a stack of presents of gifts with his name on it. There must be 70, 80 gifts. And the guy goes, what is this? And the angel says, well, those are all the gifts God the Father wanted to give you but you never asked. You never asked. So this is not the time for us to talk about the theology of prayer. And, you know, we've all wondered every once in a while, now, wait a minute, God knows everything, which means he knows my issues, problems, and needs. Why do I have to ask him? Why doesn't he just give it to me? I'm not going to get into that this morning. Here's what I'm just going to tell you. I don't know why, but this book tells me sometimes God doesn't give it to you until you ask. God, bless me. Bless the home that I live in. Bless the home that I worship in. Give us favor. Give us spiritual success. Second thing he asks for is he asks for growth. He says, enlarge my territory. Now, yes, they are trying to kick, to, to, to kick out the Canaanites from the promised land. So the initial thought is, he just wants more land. He wants more real estate. And certainly that is part of it. But again, when you do some research into what he's asking for and what he's praying for, it's so much more. Again, you have the, uh, the, the meaning up on the screen and the definition. To enlarge territory or ask for growth means to multiply, to increase, or to grow. Jabez is asking for, and he's saying, God, Give me more responsibility, give me more influence, and give me more opportunities so that we can touch more lives for God's glory. That's what he's asking for. Two weeks ago, I was here, and I was working throughout the week. I was meeting with Eli and Lena and Nicole and Lisa. We were having staff. We were going all over stuff. But that Sunday, I didn't preach. I was here two weeks ago, primarily, really exclusively, to honor and to thank Alex, as we all did. And uh, so I came and I was here for that. And, and I realized that Sunday, two weeks ago, was probably going to be one of the few Sundays that I had the opportunity to be back in kids ministry and observe what goes on there. Because I, most of the times I'm going to be up here doing this, right? So I told Alex, I said, don't take it personal, but when you start preaching, I'm going to leave. And I'm going to go hang out with the kids, right? I'm going to go hang out with Gary and see what's going on back there. So I went back there and I was with Gary and the teaching and the assistant were doing great, and the, the kids were engaged. I mean, it was good, right? 
Then, then, then Gary's like, okay, let me, let me take you out. And so he took, showed me the courtyard, and this is what we have. And he took me into the nursery area, and there was a couple in there with a baby that they could, you know, we could, they could see what's going on in the service from there. And, oh, this looks good. And then he took me out. He took me to the Sunday school room, and, and, and we peeked in because, of course, they're having class. And, uh, and, and no sooner did I peek in, like, like 15, 20 seconds later, the teacher from the class came shooting out of the class. And I don't want to say who it, who it was, but Cheryl Hoffman, uh, she came out and she goes, she started out, Pastor, it is so good to see you. And then she started in. She goes, Pastor, look in there. Look, look in the classroom. I need you to get me more kids. You got to get me more kids, Pastor. And so I said, Cheryl, it's good to see you. And yeah, we'll work on that. I was talking to Gary. So I turned back to talk to Gary. Oh, no, no. She got right in the middle of us. She got back in my grill. And she was like, Pastor, I'm not growing any younger. Your first order of business is get me more kids. So I left. I left. And uh, I had three thoughts. I had three thoughts. My first thought, I'm not ashamed to, I'm not ashamed to admit this. I was intimidated. I mean... I decided if we have a security team, Cheryl's in charge. Because, man, I love... Second, small correction. Small correction. It's not my job to get more kids. It's our job to get more kids. Turn to the person next to you and say, he's right. Go ahead and do that right now. It's our job. Third observation. Third observation. I walked away and I thought, I love that attitude. I thought, God, give me a hundred people with her attitude and we will change the South Bay. Because there was passion and there was urgency and there was dedication to invest in the kingdom, to grow and get more kids. But let's, just, let's just be honest. When we're all gone, or let's just put it this way, everyone my age and older, when we're gone, and it's going to happen at some point. We will grow old to the point that maybe we have to move closer or in with our kids or we will have to move to a retirement community or we, uh, or we will pass and we will go on to be in glory with the Lord. When everybody my age and older is gone, what do we want for Journey South Bay? Don't we want it to outlive us? The, don't we want it just to, do we want it just to survive or do we want it to thrive? The only way it thrives is if we do everything we can possibly do to make sure the backside of that building is jam-packed with kids. To make sure we grow. It's not about our glory, it's about His glory. And Jabez says, like Cheryl, give me growth. Give me growth. You know, I've been around church long enough. I've heard it all. Uh, I, I'm going to share with you three what I consider to be unbiblical reasons to not grow. Three unbiblical reasons. Number one, God isn't interested in numbers. And I want to say, who says? Who says he's not interested in numbers? In fact, when I read my Bible three times in the Old Testament, God numbers the, the Jewish nation. He counts them. Why? Because he wants to know how many they have. In fact, God is so interested in numbers, he names a book of the Bible after it. It's called the book of Numbers. Do you remember the story of the 99 sheep that are lost or are found and the one that is lost? How did he know that one was lost? He counted. He counted. You count what's valuable and important to you. I remember a couple years ago, I did a consultation with the church. I met with the board. I met with the staff. I met with the senior pastor. We were around the conference table. And I said, you've given me a lot of documents, and this is helpful, and, but there's one thing that I don't see in my file. I don't see any attendance charts from youth group, from kids' ministry and Sunday morning. I don't see the attendance numbers. And the pastor very piously said, oh, we don't count. We, we don't worry about those things. We worry about important things. We don't count. And I don't know what happened, but I said, well, do you count your offering?" Well, yeah. I said, so are you telling me that your money is more important than your people? As I recall, I never got invited back to do more consultations, but I made a point. 
I've also heard this next one. Our church wants quality, not quantity. That sounds so spiritual. (sighs) We want to be deep in the Lord. We don't just want to be big and shallow. We want to have quality disciples. And I want to say, why can't we have both? Why can't we have both? You do realize that sometimes the more quantity you get, the more quality that comes with it. Ask our worship pastor what he prefers, to have a few people sprinkled around the worship center to do worship or jam-packed in here. The more people, the more we rub off shoulders, on. the more I can hear you and you can hear me, the worship actually gets better. Sometimes quantity helps quality. Don't forget. Don't forget that God calls us to be fishers of men, not keepers of an aquarium. And while I might not be a fisherman, I talk to friends that are fishermen, and when they go fishing, you know what they say? I want as many fish as I can get, quantity, and as big a fish as I can get, quality. Let me ask it this way. How many of you in this room, by show of hands, are not a firstborn in your family? You're not a firstborn. Get your hands up. Let me see you. You're not a firstborn. Okay. So if after your parents had their first child, what would have happened if they had turned to each other and said, you know what? We have the one good quality child. <laughs> why, why worry about quantity? You wouldn't be here. And all I'm saying is, how about we shoot for both? The last one is, I prefer small, intimate churches. Now, I got to say this. I actually sympathize with this. I sympathize with this. Because it's nice to be recognized. It's nice to be recognized. You walk into church, it's nice for people to know who you are. It's nice for them to know your name, even without a name tag, right? Right? It's nice to have that. Uh, The bigger you get, have you ever gone to a big church and and, and Eli, the worship center, uh, the worship pastor says, um, turn turn around and say hi to a few people, right? But you look up and down the aisle and you don't recognize anybody. That's not as fun. It's nice to be known. And that really only happens in smaller, intimate churches. I'm completely fine with this sentiment as long as it doesn't translate into passive or active attempt to keep the church from growing. Now we got a problem. Because essentially what we're saying is my preference for a smaller church is more important than kingdom growth. Essentially what we're saying to the people who live 30 steps across the street from us that are not with us this morning. You know what? I'm already in the kingdom. I'm already going to go to heaven. I don't really care if you go to hell. That's essentially what we're saying to them. You know, the most mature Christians I've ever met are the Christians that say, I'm willing to put my preferences to the side. We all have preferences. Preferences for food. Preferences for movies. Preferences for church. What music we sing, how loud it is, what program we have, what the pastor does, what the kids do. We all have preferences. Nothing wrong with them. The most mature people I have ever met are willing to say, I have preferences, but I'm willing to put those preferences to the side to reach those people that live right across the street. And the last thing he says, he says, God, give me your protection. You know what's interesting? I'm going to spend the shortest amount on this, but it's what he spends the most time on his prayer. He says like the same thing three times. He's like, God, let your hand be upon me. Protect me. Keep me from pain. It's most of the prayer. And and it's almost as if Jabez is nervous. It's almost as if Jabez is scared. It's almost as if he thinks someone is out to get him. What's going on? Here's what's going on. You want to know? When you pray for blessing from God and he gives it to you, and you pray for growth from God and he gives it to you, guaranteed the enemy will know and he will counterattack. And when he does, you and I will never be in a position where we more need God's power, protection, and his presence. Because he knows what we're doing this morning. And he will know when we fill up the backside of this building. Someone has said this. If you're not running into the devil on a consistent basis, maybe it's because you're both running in the same direction. But if you pray your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth, as it is in heaven, uh, in my family, 
at my work, in my church. Your kingdom come in my church. You pray that prayer and you mean it. You best be prepared when you walk out of this door, out of these doors to face spiritual warfare because it's coming. There was a Methodist preacher, and I'm going to end with this, Samuel Chadwick, that said this. Let's put it on the screen. The one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, and prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil. He mocks at our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. So how about we make him shake in his boots? The only way you do that is you either have to increase the amount of time that you pray or you have to improve your prayer content. Here's what I want you to do. Everybody take out your cell phone real quick. Go ahead and take it out. Everyone take out your cell phone if you have it with you. And I want you to turn and go to your alarm or your clock. Put the last slide up there, please. Thank you. I want to, I want to give you the 410 challenge. Why 410? That's the prayer. From 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to your clock. I want you to go to alar your alarm. And I want you to find 410. I would suggest 410 in the afternoon, not 410 in the morning. And I want you to put that alarm on for every single day. Every single day. Do it right now. If you don't know how to do that, just find someone that's under the age of 20 and they will help you. Okay? <laughs> Honestly, I don't care if it's 410. I care that you do it. And here, I've been doing it since Monday. And my family had, doesn't even know about this. Every day at 410, when that alarm comes and it goes, I just hit off real quickly. Sometimes I'm in the middle of conversation. Sometimes I'm driving. Sometimes I'm by myself. And when that alarm goes off, I pray for three things. God bless my church. God, grow our church. God, protect our church. It's three things. It'll take you five seconds, or if you think about it a little longer, you can go longer. God, bless us. God, grow us. God, protect us. If you're willing to pray that prayer, whether it's at 410 or any time during the day, if you're willing to pray it at least for the next week or the whole month of June, hold up your hand or hold up your phone. I love it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today thanking you for the house that we live in, our family, and the house that we worship in, our church. And Father, we take a moment now to literally apply what we learned. Instead of me talking, I'm going to give you 40 seconds and I'm going to want you to do some business with the Holy Spirit. You could simply pray that prayer. Pray those three things, whether it be for your family, your home that you live in, or the home that you worship in. Let's not just talk about prayer. Let's actually do it. I'm going to give you 35, 40 seconds, just you and God. Go ahead and do that right now. Why don't you all stand with me as I close this out in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you for Journey South Bay and we thank you for the difference that it's made in our life. And Father, we are believing and we are asking you to give us the opportunity to have an impact on this neighborhood and this community. We ask us that you bless us with your power and your wisdom. We ask us that you help us grow spiritually and numerically that you take our kids' ministry and our youth ministry, small group ministry, Sunday morning, and you bring us more people. Give us the opportunity and the privilege to tell, us, tell them about your son, Jesus. And Father, we're not naive. We know that as we pray that, the enemy knows that we're praying that. And if we see fruit, he knows that he's, he knows that he's going to come after us. So I pray that you would protect us. 
I pray that you would bind us together. I, would, I pray that you would, you would teach us to take sin and temptation very, very seriously. I pray that we would go out of our way to encourage other brothers and sisters in Christ in terms of how they're living, what they're saying, what they're doing. Father Jabez was more honorable than others. And while we aren't in competition with any other Christian or any other church, we want to make you proud. So we're asking for that. Bless us, grow us, and protect us. We pray all this in Jesus' name and all God's people said.